Welcome to General Equilibrium on NyQuil. This is going to be the first of like five or six parts on General Equilibrium modeling in this particular course. So I guess uh, here we go. Let's get started, shall we? Now we've learned all about equilibrium in economics. You know, a lot of economics, almost all of economics is equilibrium and it's when demand and supply are equal to each other. And this occurs when the market's clear, so there's no excess demand or any excess supply. Most of what you've learned, though, was partial equilibrium. Actually, I guarantee you all of what you've learned was partial equilibrium. And it's when you've got one market in equilibrium, say the guns market, or maybe for two markets, like guns and butter. But there, there's a lot more than just two markets to the economy. I mean, the economy is you know, filled with tons of markets. So if we're only modeling like one market, we're missing a lot. We're, we're really leaving out a lot of super vital, useful information that could otherwise be incorporated by only looking at these one or two markets. Now, there are, you know, way more than two markets or, you know, it really, it, the number of markets that we would have to include to really include the entire economy, like, you, you couldn't do. There's just way, way too many markets, and it's going to be impossible to get all the necessary data on those markets. But we can take a lot of markets and aggregate them up and look at the aggregate behavior of these markets, because, you know, th this is macro modeling. This isn't micro stuff, right? So we're not going to be concerned about behavior in individual, like, you know, what's happening in the like, you know, the, the gasoline market in, you know, middle of nowhere Georgia or middle of nowhere Tennessee, like, you know, macroeconomists aren't really going to be particularly interested in that. They're more interested in, you know, like what's going on with the oil industry overall, right? Just like in, at the aggregate rather than individual little components of the market. So, we can aggregate a lot of these markets up to just a few aggregate markets, and then we can look at how they're moving together. And we can really use these models to help guide some of the um, like stylized fact that you've learned in principles of macroeconomics of like, you know, if there's a demand shock, then you know you'll see an, an increase in inflation, but there'll also be an increase in production or output. Right, like those types of things, we can actually use these models to give us some of the the intuition. So we can we can learn where a lot of that stuff can come from. So these models are like extremely useful. And so when we use this, right, we're gonna like aggregate these markets. We're gonna look at how they all behave together in the economy, and then we can use that to understand like policy implications of big changes within the economy. So, in this lecture series, we're going to first learn the concept of general equilibrium in an intuitive sense. That's what today's lecture is going to be. We'll learn how the models work, like what they're meant to tell us, all that fun stuff. Then we're going to learn about the dynamic general equilibrium model. And first we're going to learn about household decision-making behavior. Right. This is going to be, you know, the household has a utility function. They choose how much they want to consume each period, how much labor they want to supply each period. And then based on that, they'll maximize their utility. They decide how much they want to consume today, how much they want to save today to be able to consume tomorrow, etc. Once we've learned that, we're going to learn how the firm works. We're going to understand the firm's decision-making behavior. And then we're going to learn how those two are going to interact with one another in equilibrium because the household is going to be where we get demand from. The firm's going to be where we get supply from. When we set demand and supply equal to each other, we have equilibrium. But then we're going to add that kid in the corner that eats glue, and we're going to call him the government. We're going to analyze fiscal and monetary policy changes in the aggregate economy and see how that is going to be affecting the household decision-making behavior and the firm's decision-making behavior. These models are used all throughout academia and in central banks. And central banks use them when they're coming up with how monetary policy changes, we, we call them shocks in the research literature, will be affecting the economy. Like, you know, how's it going to affect consumer behavior? How's it going to affect the firm's behavior? 
you know, for central banks, if they have to raise interest rates, what's that going to mean for government behavior, you know, for the issuance of new government debt, right? There, there, there's a lot of, like, little interdependencies that are going to be super important that we're going to be learning about with these types of models. So time to talk about what a general equilibrium model is. Let's say, first, you have an economy with a bunch of identical consumers. Now, the fact that they're identical is what's called a simplifying assumption, right? It, it's a minor abstraction from reality, but it makes things a little bit easier to model. Now, these consumers all have some utility function that gets used to determine their preferences. And since they're identical consumers, their utility functions are also going to be identical. And they can choose from two things. They can choose how much to consume. If they consume, they buy stuff to use today. Or they can save, in which case if they save, their savings will accrue interest. And they'll be saving more today, thus they'll be consuming less today if the interest rate's higher. And if they save today, they get to consume more tomorrow. And they do some combination of this based on the relative prices of each, their incomes, and, of course, their preferences. So what are their preferences like? Well, let's plot out, just for a minute here, CT plus 1, which is tomorrow's consumption, on the vertical axis, and CT, which is today's consumption, on the horizontal axis. And the relationship between CT and CT plus 1 in this sense, is going to be the, f the household's um, utility function, their preferences. And so this utility function is actually like a three-dimensional shape, but with this three-dimensional shape, any particular level that we choose will be a level of utility given that agent's income. And it's what's known as an indifference curve. Because on this curve, Right? There is some level of utility that can be achieved at any point on this curve. So whether you consume this much here today and this much tomorrow, you'll be just as happy as if you consume this much tomorrow and then this much today. So any combination that satisfies this particular curve here, any combination of current and future consumption that satisfies this curve will make you just as happy as any other combination that satisfies that particular curve. Now, how do we know which point on this curve is going to be our utility maximizing point? Well, we need a budget constraint for that. So the household faces a budget constraint. And what it says is that income can't be exceeded by the sum of consumption expenditures and savings. So for example, right, if we've got this budget constraint here, y equals y, which is income, equals C, consumption, plus S, savings. If we've got this, and you earn 100 bucks a month, so Y is equal to 100, you can't spend 80 bucks on consumer goods and $40 on savings. You have to spend 80 and 20. <clears throat> or 60 and 40, all right? Any combination you spend can't exceed $100. Now, the income can come from two sources, labor income, working, where you decide how much labor to supply based on the wage rate being paid, and non-labor income, which is income from like investments, asset holdings, etc. So I kind of lied when I first talked about the household's utility function, saying there's you know two things they choose, consumption and savings. There's really, you know, three that we'll be thinking about. Now, the first model of this type that you'll actually be seeing, the labor decisions are like implicit within the model, so you won't have to actually choose any labor supply stuff. But the household's gonna be deriving a demand for consumer goods, there's a supply of capital, and then a supply of labor. The demand for consumer goods is how much they wanna consume today. The supply of capital is how much they save today, because what you save today, somebody else can borrow and use for something, and then they'll give it back to you tomorrow, plus a little bit of interest, right? So if you save, and the firm goes, hey, I want to borrow your money to expand my business, I'll pay you back, you go, sure, cool, sounds good to me. And so you let them borrow the money, they come back with the money tomorrow, with a little bit of extra money on top of it. That's how you consume more tomorrow. But then you also have to decide how much you want to work, because if, you know, okay, the supply of capital, your savings, right, that's only going to get you so far. You still need to be able to generate some kind of income 
first to be able to you know have that income which can then be either consumed or saved and how do you do that well you know you do that with labor i mean i guess there's also like you know an initial endowment if you want to start with that or you know you're um given a um some inheritance that you know you got and you know, sure whatever right it's getting getting a little too far off track here so for the consumer they decide how much the consumer save based on the interest rate the higher the interest rate the more you're going to want to save right if the interest rate is like 15 percent you're probably not going to consume a whole lot today you'll consume as much as you have to of course but you're going to go man i can really consume a lot more you know tomorrow next month next quarter next year whatever it is if I just save a little bit today. So the higher the interest rate, the more you're going to want to save, the more you will save, and the less you're going to consume today, but you get to consume tomorrow. So in the future, overall consumption is higher. And you're going to decide how much labor to supply based on the wage rate. The higher the wage rate is, the more labor you're going to be willing to supply. If I offered you a job at five bucks an hour, you'd be like, yo, pound sand, I'm not doing it but I offered you a job at, say, 25 bucks an hour, probably going to be a little bit more likely to do it. Let's say I offer you a job at $150 an hour. I bet every single one of you will go, uh, yeah, for $150 an hour, sure, I'll do it. What do you need done? So the higher the wage rate, the more labor you're going to be willing to supply. Not just how how many people are going to be willing to work, but also how many hours are they going to be willing to work? You know, if you get paid $150 an hour, you're probably going to be willing to work, you know, as many hours each day that you possibly can because, okay, you know, you, you work a lot early on, save up a bunch of money, and then you don't need to work as much later. So the more labor you supply, the more income you have, and then the more consumption you can enjoy. But, you know, work sucks, right? Nobody really likes working, so there's, there's a trade-off here, and with that trade-off, there's a trade-off between consumption, which is, you know, funded by labor income. If you work, you get to consume more, or there's leisure, and so if you don't work, you get to sit on your ass, but if you sit on your ass, you know, you're going to be broke, right? If you've ever seen that movie Office Space, there's this great line where this guy's like, he's asked um, what he'd do if he had a million dollars, and he's like... I would do nothing. I would sit on my ass all day and do nothing. And the dude that asked him is like, nothing? You don't need a million dollars to do nothing. Hell, take a look at my cousin. He's broke. Don't do shit. Right? So, you know, you don't need a lot of money to be able to do nothing. It's just you can't really expect to be able to consume a whole lot either. So, getting off track here. But these decisions are made to maximize lifetime utility. So there's going to be like a utility function today. There's going to be one tomorrow, the next day, and the next day. And so if you've learned, say, if you've taken intermediate micro or if you've taken principles of micro and you learn about utility maximization, it's just that. It's only repeated, though. So when you did utility maximization in, say, principles of micro, that was just once. Or you do it once, and that's, that's just the model, right? There's, there's nothing after that. There's nothing before that. It's just that's the model. In dynamic macro, on the other hand, you'll do utility maximization that one day, but then the next day you do it again and again and again and again and again. But because you're consuming or saving, if you save, you consume more tomorrow. So the choice you make today in your utility maximization is going to affect the utility maximization tomorrow, and then that's going to affect the next day and so on and so forth. So it's not just what happens today, it's what happens today, what happens tomorrow is a result, and then when we're in tomorrow, okay, what happens today, what happens tomorrow, so on and so forth. And it's not just with the consumption savings behavior, it's also with the labor supply. Because, like I said, work sucks. You don't really want to work any more than you absolutely have to. But of course, you know, with a nice enough wage rate, then maybe you'd be induced to work a little bit more. So that's the household. Let's talk about the firm next. Now, just like households, all firms are identical. And all firms in this model 
will be producing final consumer goods. Now, there are other types of models where there's like intermediate goods they're producing, and then those are sent. We're not going to worry about that here. That's a little too advanced. It's that, honestly, for what you guys will be doing for an, you know, an undergraduate level, that's, that would just be math for the sake of math. It wouldn't be anything useful. So we just have a firm that produces final consumer goods. They use labor and capital to produce. Labor is provided by the household, because the household decides how much they want to work. And when they decide how much they want to work, you know, it's, okay, based on the wage rate, and it's based on how much stuff they want to be able to consume. So their demand for stuff generates a supply of other stuff. Right? If, you know, you like, you know, owning a lot of really nice guitars, well... Say you work, I don't know, you work for like a bank doing some kind of like quantitative modeling. Well, if you work for a bank doing quantitative modeling, that's great. That's awesome. And the income you get from doing modeling for a bank then can be used to buy really nice fancy guitars, right? So your demand for guitars is going to be generating the supply of banking services for other people. Now, capital, which is the other input for production, can be owned by the firm or the household, depending on the assumptions inherent to the model. If we assume that it's owned by the household, it's generated by their savings of income, which is then lent to the firm, who borrow that money, use it to produce stuff, and then when they earn profits, they're shared with the owners of the capital. And according to Rule of Acquisition 202, the justification for profit is, in fact, profit. So Quark would be very pleased with these types of models because the firm maximizes profit. They have a profit function which relates revenues from production and the costs of production. So it's total revenue minus total cost. They derive a demand for labor and a demand for capital. And they produce consumer goods, which are then sold to the consumers on the market, and profits from the firm get distributed to the owners of the capital. I swear to God, if you've never seen Office Space, you've got to watch this movie. It's absolutely fantastic. It's like the Bible of work. And if you've ever worked in an office, this movie is just... It's kind of scary how, how close they get this movie. It, it really is. Moving on. The firm decides how much to produce. So that's the first thing that they do. They're going to go, how much do we want to make? Then they're going to decide how much labor they want to use based on the wage rate and the rental rate of capital. And they're going to decide how much capital they're going to use based on the rental rate of capital and the wage rate. So there's like a little interdependency here. The demand for labor is dependent on the wage rate, but it's also dependent on the cost of the other um, input. So... If, say, capital is relatively more expensive than labor, the firm's going to say, screw it, we're going to use more labor than we are capital. If capital's relatively less expensive than labor, then they're going to go, screw it, we're going to fire a bunch of people and we're just going to use machines instead. Sound a little familiar? So the firm's got a production function, which, I mean, could really look like any number of things. I'm going to assume it looks like this. And you're probably going, all right, yeah, what, what the heck is this? Well, okay, K is capital. So capital is that first input that we're talking about. L is labor. So i got capital and labor. And those exponents, alpha and one minus alpha, what is that? Well, alpha is capital's share of income. One minus alpha is labor's share of income. And if we were to add those exponents up, they would equal one. So this production function has constant returns to scale, which means if you double the inputs, you double the outputs. Finally, A. A is the source of technology shocks, which is like new inventions and stuff like that. So if Zephram Cochran invents the warp drive and takes his spaceship, the Phoenix, out for a spin around the solar system, travels at warp, and we make uh, first contact with an alien species, you know, the Vulcans, then all the cool stuff that comes out of that, you know, came from that technology shock of Zephram Cochran building his warp engine. Even if we don't have first contact with aliens, We've got warp drive. Awesome. We can get to Mars like super fast. We can mine the hell out of it and bring all that cool stuff back. Sounds great. We can go to the moon. I don't know if there's really anything particularly useful to mine out of the moon, but hey, we can try. Why the hell not? Because it'll take us literally a split second to get there. And we can go all over the place with warp drive. So space travel is 
much cheaper. It's much more efficient. So that source of technology shocks, what that does is that makes production cheaper. It makes production more efficient, which means we can produce more with less stuff. So when it comes to labor and capital, there's more than one way to skin a cat. So just like the utility function, that indifference curve I showed you for the household, there is something very similar in the production function. The production function is a 3D function, right? Because it's output and there are two inputs. There's capital and there's labor. So if we were to look at it, it'd be this like 3D like bowl shape thing that we would have. But if we were to boil it down to say two dimensions rather than three, well, we could have say capital and labor. Capital on one axis, labor on the other. We would have capital here and labor here. So labor is the vertical axis, capital is the horizontal axis. And for this particular curve here, this would be a certain level of output that is satisfied by any combination of labor or capital. So if you want to skin, let's say this particular level here, this particular um, isoquant, it's called for production, this particular isoquant is say 10 cats. Well, you can skin 10 cats by having a lot of men with fingernails and not a whole lot of machines. You could also skin 10 cats by having a lot of machines and very few men with fingernails. Either way, 10 cats get skinned. And then I'm going to get in trouble for something on YouTube, I'm sure, by using this example. However, this example is not original to me. Um, I actually borrowed it from Deirdre McCloskey, who is a brilliant economist. I read her price theory book before my first year in grad school. And I remember coming across this um, example on labor and capital inputs on skinning cats. She's awesome. She's so cool. Anyways, moving along. There's a cost function that relates the cost of production with the inputs of production. So total cost is the wage rate times amount of labor that you use, W times L, plus the rental rate of capital, which is the real interest rate, times the amount of capital that's being used in production. Now, labor and capital, as I've mentioned before, have some degree of substitutability. If the cost of labor goes up, firms are going to use less labor and more capital if that's possible. Not, It's not always possible, but sometimes it is. So you can say the conditional input factor demands are dependent on their prices and the other factors' prices. Maybe you've heard $15 an hour means McDonald's going to be using robots. Well, it's actually not that far off. And, you know, I'm not saying that is a politicized statement. It's just simply a statement of fact. If you make labor relatively more expensive than capital, places like McDonald's are going to find ways to use capital more than labor. And, you know, we've seen this. We saw this throughout uh, the, the COVID pandemic as the place, you know, places started to reopen, but they were struggling to find labor. All of a sudden, you know, if you go to a restaurant, there were those little robots that have the multiple shelves and the servers could put drinks on the, the robots and then send them out to the, the tables and you can just sort of take your drink off of the, the robot. Or, you know, if they were really, really brave, they could send the food out on the robots and you could just sort of take your plate off of the robot. Because while labor itself wasn't more expensive than capital in terms of like monetary value, it was just so hard to find labor. It just wasn't there. So they had to go to the only thing that they could, which is capital, robots. So in terms of like resource costs, yes, labor was more expensive than capital was then. However, that's because the labor just you know, wasn't available. But if, say, labor was 20 bucks an hour, 30 bucks an hour, 50 bucks an hour, what would happen is firms would be shifting more towards capital, and they would be investing more in capital, and you would see development in capital really exceed the use of labor in production. So let's put all this all this crap together. The household derives a demand curve, and in macroeconomics, it's an aggregate demand curve, which, you know, it's not quite as simple as just like, oh, we're going to derive a demand for one market, but it kind of is, same-ish idea. Household is going to derive a labor supply curve based on how much they want to work. The more, the higher the wage rate, the more you're going to want to work. Labor supply would be upward sloping, and then 
aggregate demand, just like regular demand, is going to be downward sloping. And the firm is going to derive a supply curve. The firm's going to derive demand curves for labor and capital because if they want labor, well, labor's got a cost. It's the wage rate. The higher the wage rate, the less labor they're going to want to use. Right? The higher the rental rate of capital, the less capital they're going to want to use, the more labor they're going to want to use instead. So they're both labor and capital, their demands are going to be downward sloping. And that supply curve comes from, you know, basically maximizing their profits, seeing how much they want to produce. And then from there, we can get an aggregate supply curve. And when aggregate supply and aggregate demand intersect, we have an equilibrium. Where labor demand and labor supply intersect, we have an equilibrium. Where capital demand and capital supply intersect, we have an equilibrium. So what makes all this different from partial equilibrium? Well, we'd have labor markets, capital markets, and consumer goods markets. And we haven't really even explained all the players yet. So in partial equilibrium, it would be like, let's look at the labor market. In general equilibrium, it's let's look at the labor market, look how it affects the capital market, and let's take a look at how those two affect production, which then affects the consumer goods markets. So we're taking multiple markets. We are modeling them in a way that they are like interlinked with each other. And then in doing so, if we were to change, say, the wage rate, we can see that employment would go down, capital use would go up, and say maybe production would fall a little bit. If production falls, that would be a negative supply side shock. So you would end up with an increase in prices or inflation and then a reduction in output. But we haven't even gotten to all the players yet. We haven't explained all the markets yet. Maybe you thought I did, but haha, -ha, joke's on you. We still got more. We have that kid in the corner eating glue named the government. Now, the government taxes and borrows to generate revenue, which they spend on various projects. Some of these are for things like paying government workers, the military, the police, all that stuff. Others are counter-cyclical, like the stimmies that went out two years ago. Trust me, we're going to be getting way into that towards the end of the course. But there's also a monetary authority. What's the monetary authority? Well, that's the central bank. In the United States, it's the Federal Reserve. And they buy and sell government bonds to affect the money supply because they've got a monopoly over the supply of money. And so they'll use their open market operations to affect the supply of money. So they alter the money supply based on the demand for money. There's also a usually counter-cyclical component to this as well. Right? As the economy tends to do poorly, the central bank will increase the nominal quantity of money in hopes of providing liquidity to the institutions that need it. We've gone through that a good bit so far. We'll learn more about it later. But the idea behind this is that the government and the monetary authority are going to try to unscrew things up when things get screwed up. And each of these will be used to affect aggregate demand, increase or decrease it as necessary. They don't affect supply. They're not really that good at dealing with supply shocks. They are fairly good at dealing with demand shocks, usually. Not always, but they're usually fairly good, or at least the monetary authority is fairly good at dealing with demand shocks. Can't quite say the fiscal authority is, but the monetary authority is generally pretty good about it. For any of you fans who've or any of uh, you Parks and Rec fans. Not too far off from my thoughts. Anyways, we have these two players, and the two players were, you know, the, the two new players, I mean, were the fiscal authority and the monetary authority. We got a few new markets to add in. Well, we got bond markets, right, because the government's going to sell bonds in order to be able to fund their purchases via debt. The central bank is going to have the money market. For each of these markets, we're going to have demand and supply. We're going to have money demand, money supply, demand for bonds, supply of bonds. And so in our framework, the markets that we would have would be labor demand, labor supply, capital demand, capital supply, money demand, money supply, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, demand for bonds, supply of bonds, and 
each of these would get their own equation. And there would be some other equations on top of that that are basically going to help make sure that uh, various resource, resource constraints are satisfied and that various you know, flows over time are satisfied, et cetera. So when labor demand equals labor supply, capital demand equals capital supply, money demands money supply, aggregate demands equal to aggregate supply, demand for bonds, supply of bonds are equal. When these are all considered to be in equilibrium, then we have a general equilibrium. So because we've got one more, one, yeah, more than one market, this is, in fact, a general equilibrium. And we can put more markets in there if we want, but it means more equations. So kind of like, uh, you know, there, there's an app for that, there's an app for that, there's an app for this. Well, there's an equation for that, there's a market for that. And with more markets, say, you know, the government selling bonds, what happens? Well, if the government begins selling bonds in the market, then that's, in terms of the savings, right, households are still going to save. It's just those savings are now split up between capital and government bonds. So it's less capital for the firm to acquire and use. And if you've heard about the crowding out effect, this is what's going on. Private investments being crowded out by government spending. Because if you've got 20 bucks to save and there's no government, then all of that $20 is going to the firm. When the government comes in, let's say they split your savings in half, or they take half of your savings. So, you know, you buy $10 of government bonds, and then the other $10 goes to the firm. Well, that firm, their investment has now been crowded out by the government wanting to also borrow your money so they can turn around and spend it on, you know, all sorts of stuff like reducing inflation. So if you alter one of these markets, it's going to generate spillover effects to the other markets. So let's say the economy enters a recession. There's a negative demand shock. Consumers begin spending less and saving more. Interest rates are higher. Firms produce less stuff, lay off workers. The government sells bonds to help try to stimulate the economy because when they sell bonds, they're borrowing money. So they borrow money and then they redistribute it throughout the economy. Those were stimmies that were being sent out during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, the central bank's going to buy those bonds to try to lower the interest rate to stimulate borrowing. Consumer spending will begin to increase because interest rates are low, so consumers will want to consume more and save less. And because consumers are spending more, there's more borrowing going on by the firm. The economy's being stimulated. Firms are going to want to hire more labor to increase production. And the economy would begin to do better. Now, it may do better than what it was before the recession, but if it does, it's not going to be long-lived. The economy is eventually going to return to where it was before the recession. And based on what we've covered so far in this course, I'm going to leave it to you to try to think about what, what it is that is causing the economy to return to where it was before the recession in the long run if, say, production increases above where it was in the long run as a result of the government spending and the central bank expansion of the money supply. So if we change one market, it's going to affect labor, capital, money, bonds, etc. It's going to affect all of the other markets in this system. So what can we expect overall? Well, in this lecture series, we're going to be learning about how the individual moving parts work in the economy. We're going to learn how to derive a general equilibrium mathematically and graphically. We're going to learn how to impose shocks to the equilibrium. We're going to learn how each player in each market is going to respond to those shocks in the equilibrium and what the quantitative and qualitative responses are to different shocks. Now, I'm going to be more interested in the qualitative responses to shocks here rather than the quantitative because for the quantitative, well, you'd need a computer program and you'd have to you know, set in the initial conditions and let the equilibrium stuff run. We're not really going to be doing that, so don't worry. But the qualitative responses are extremely important, and dynamic general equilibrium modeling is a fascinating way to understand what those qualitative responses are. So overall, we want to learn about how the economy responds to shocks and what the mechanisms are behind how the economy responds to those shocks. If we know that, we can know what policies can be used to improve the situation and what policies just don't work at all or work very poorly. So with all of that said, this is going to wrap up this particular lecture video. The next one is going to be covering household optimization behavior. Fascinating stuff. I would definitely stick around to make sure uh, you get to watch that too. So thank you for watching, and you will see me again in the next video.